our time is that nobody believes he really exists. He's not going to come and encounter us in a theological discussion to say anything bad about God and good uh, anything bad about God or anything good about himself because that would be too obvious. But as long as he's able to be somehow hiding and devious and as long as our sophisticated generation doesn't really accept that he exists, he has carte blanche. We think the devil doesn't exist and he likes it that way because that means he can roam free around us and he can play all of his games because we don't think he exists and we don't put up the proper spiritual armor to try and confront him. That's why we need to learn about St. Anthony and all these saints because they give us the spiritual wisdom that we need to fight the devil in spiritual warfare. St. Anthony was born in the year 261 AD in the area of Egypt and uh, from a very wealthy and rich family. St. Anthony was, from the very beginning, even as a child, a, a humble, simple human being. He did not enjoy going out much, playing. He preferred staying at home. And while he did not receive a formal education, he was quite an intelligent young man. When St. Anthony was, was 18 years old, his parents passed away. And at the time, he had a very, he had a really young sister that he had to take care of that he was put in charge of. And what he does is he ensures that she's taken care of. He sends her to a convent. About six months later, a defining moment happened in his life, something that changed his life forever. St. Anthony go going to church, thinking about his life and the life in Christ and the death of his parents was struck by the gospel reading of the day, the gospel reading of the rich young man where Jesus says to the man, answers his question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he heard the words, if you would be perfect, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and you'll find treasure in heaven. He took these words literally. He left that church that day and he gave what he had to the poor. So he abandons his wealth, takes care of his sister, and then he begins sort of a journey which we would describe as the origins of monasteries and monasticism. In this day and age, as well as in the day and age of St. Anthony, but especially today where we're running around doing this, that, and everything, and we don't have time to really see who we are, to see our sins, to see, you know, the emptiness within us, so that we can then turn to God. How can you turn to God? We didn't even know that you need to turn to Him. St. Anthony knew that. In the beginning, he started that long path of meditation, of endless prayer, and of um, contemplation. So he leaves the city in which he's raised, and he lives sort of on the outskirts. Living in the outskirts, he comes into connection with many Christian hermits. In these little huts that he would be going to, he would be meeting elderly individuals. And from each elderly individual, he would pick up a certain virtue. He receives dis different lessons in humility, in love, in patience, in prayer, and in a life devoted and solitary to God. Each virtue that he picked up from each of these huts ultimately made who St. Anthony was going to be. In a time where his peers were fighting political, powerful forces and heresies, Anthony soon learned after retreating to the desert that he would be fighting the most difficult opponent of all, Satan himself. After the time of St. Constantine and the legalization of Christianity, the persecutions ended and we have a new form of martyrdom that we call monasticism, where people, during the, the persecutions, many times Christians had to be held back because they were too willing to give up their lives. Uh, people always say, well, aren't monks just running away from the world and aren't they just running up to close themselves in a cell? Uh, the reality is, for St. Anthony, he is uh, running out to find a fight. Uh, at that time, it was thought that uh, the demons lived in the wilderness. That was the place where they resided. So he leaves civilization not to avoid the temptation, but to go looking for the devil, to go looking for the demons, to be able to battle them. I hate to put it this way, but the devil probably said, I'm going to use all my powers to try and get him. He's too involved with this Christ. but. We gotta bring more reinforcements over, not to make light of the matter, but that's probably what the devil said. We gotta bring more reinforcements over. This guy's gonna be hard to get. So we, we have to throw everything at him and then we can't. 
St. Anthony probably started out like most of us would, willing to take on his own weaknesses. Gradually, it was revealed to him that the power behind those weaknesses, that it was a power, that it was the devil. And so the struggle becomes deeper and deeper. And as it becomes deeper, he has to take more and more extreme measures. He moves further out into the desert, further away from the people, more determined to fight the fight. After visiting and staying with and learning from various individuals, solitary monastics, St. Anthony then decides to live in a cave, what was a tomb. And a friend of his comes along and shuts the door of that tomb. And there we see the beginning of this intense battle that Satan has with St. Anthony. The devil, of course, begins his attack on St. Anthony in some very cunning ways. The issue of guilt becomes an issue that Anthony has to grapple with immediately. The devil tells him, uh, what about your sister? Don't you feel bad that you left her in the world alone? Look at all the good you could have done with all that money that your parents left you and you just gave away. Why did you do that? Why don't you go back to that? It could be yours again. What Satan tries to do is he tries to break us down. And the best way to break us down is making us feel guilty about ourselves because guilt destroys our self-esteem and who we are and our trust in God because we shun away from God. The same thing happened to Adam and Eve. They knew they were guilty when they ate from the fruit. And what they do, they went and hid. Because they knew they were guilty. They would not approach God. As far as the discipline of prayer, St. Anthony developed a method where he would tie knots in a rope and say the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, over and over to teach him a sense of unceasing prayer. But as he would sleep at night, the demons would enter and untie the knots of the rope to try to detour St. Anthony from his unceasing prayer. Tradition teaches us that the Theotokos herself or an angel came to St. Anthony and taught him how to tie the knots of the rope in a cross-style pattern that are so intricate that could not be untied by the demons. At one point, the devil tempts uh, Anthony the Great with loud noises. And it's interesting that Anthony, as the father of monasticism, practiced a lot of what is called isihia, or silence. Gregory Palamas and others picked up on that style of monasticism, and it is one of the virtues of monasticism, the idea of silence and solitude. Uh, the purpose of isihia, or silence, solitude, is that we may quell all of our anxieties and try to hear God and therefore tempting someone with loud noises is a distraction and tries is an attempt to keep people from hearing God and listening to God. Anthony realizing that it is Satan who is putting these thoughts in his head, who is tempting him, realizes that he needs to fortify himself. And just like any good athlete, any good student who knows that he or she needs to have discipline and to be prepared for the oncoming battle, St. Anthony does that. He usually never sleeps laying down. He sleeps up against a rock or on the bare ground. He doesn't own anything in the world. He eats only bread and water and that sparingly. And sometimes we wonder what that's all about. The struggle is against our own body, our desires and the flesh. And by doing that, they conquer the flesh in order to gain God's kingdom. They understand that the needs and desires of the body often, if not always, are a barrier between themselves and their salvation. St. Anthony also was not idle while he was in the cave. Even though his prayer life was consistent and he was praying throughout the entire day, he was also doing work. He was weaving baskets and he would be giving these baskets to the people that would bring him food to take him back to the villages. It's unique because it correlates together with St. Paul's epistle that speaks about those who were being idle, waiting for God's kingdom to happen, yet waiting for people to wait on them. And Paul said that those who do not wish to work, let them go hungry. Satan, now seeing St. Anthony fortified with the ascetic lifestyle, decides to send a multitude of demons to go and beat him up. The gentleman that closed the door of the tomb 
would periodically go back to the tomb to bring bread for St. Anthony. On the, this occasion, when he goes to the tomb and opens it up, he sees St. Anthony on the ground of the tomb, badly beaten up. When his friends saw him, he assumed he was dead. He picks him up and he carries him back to the village. He lays him in the house there, in the little hut, and everyone in the village thinks he's dead. St. Anthony revived and he insisted on going back and being sealed again back in that tomb. Even laying flat on his back, looking up at the top of the sealed tomb, he addressed the demons by telling them that he is ready for battle again, that he will not run away from them. But he said, here I am, I am Anthony. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. Give me your best shot. And they did. And at that point, Satan, in the guise of various beasts, brings his demons in there, lions, bulls, leopards. And the one is about to, to leap at St. Anthony. In the center of this great tumult, Anthony turns to all of the attackers, all the animals, all the demons manifested in these beasts, and says to them, why were so many of you sent here? One of you could have finished me off. Why didn't you come alone? And he just sort of stands there and says, you know, if you were given leave to eat me, then I'm ready. But if not, I'm a servant of Christ, depart. And uh, it's almost like the crack of a whip. They just turn and scatter. In the middle of this great tumult, this crisis, a beam of light streams into the tomb. Anthony, knowing it was God, in a moment of weakness, says to him, where were you? Why didn't you help me? Look at me, I am all but dead. Christ not only assures St. Anthony that he was with him throughout all of his struggles, but that he will forever be his helper and that St. Anthony's renown will be known everywhere. The beauty of this episode is that it allows us to see the humanity of Anthony. It allows us to identify greater with him within the own struggles and turmoils we have in our own lives, to know that even in a moment of weakness, God does not abandon us, but God builds us up and allows us to show our love for him. St. Anthony is now about 35 years old. He has spent 15 years in the tomb, and he decides to go now out into the wilderness. So he leaves the cave. Withdrawing further into the wilderness as he's moving from the tombs where he lived to uh, the mountain where he is going to eventually live, uh, there's a story of him uh, seeing money or gold along the path. St. Anthony knows that this is a temptation of the evil one and steps over it as he stepped over the devil in his own life so many times. He crosses the Nile River and he finds an old abandoned fort. He has about six months supply of bread and he goes into this fort and he locks himself into the fort and for 20 years in this fort he does not permit anyone to come and visit him inside the fort and he continues his aesthetic life the aesthetic struggle pilgrims would approach the mountain from far off and hear the clash of armor and they would go up there and they would just see saint anthony sitting there and we realized that he was fighting the demons hand to hand defeating them constantly. And they'd become frightened for St. Anthony and actually frightened for themselves. And St. Anthony basically said to them, do the sign of the cross, mention the name of Christ, and you'll have nothing to fear on your way back home. And they would do that. They would make the sign of the cross, mention the name of Christ, and have a safe journey back home. At one point when St. Anthony is uh, in solitary for so long as a recluse, and he's locked up for a good 20 years or so, um, the people that are out amongst the deserts, also the other monastics and hermits, eventually want to see him. They want to you know, be able to receive advice from him and guidance and see him. And as so they go up and they, they tear the door down to be able to, to get a, a glimpse of him and to speak with him and to get counsel. There is a discourse in the life of St. Anthony where St. Anthony relates to the monastics what he himself has encountered, what he himself has experienced, and, and gives them encouragement uh, by telling them what he has undergone, the struggles, the physical struggles, the spiritual struggles, the struggles against the demons, and how they need to fortify themselves with Christ through prayer, through fasting, through contemplation, 
through love for one another. And through the wisdom he offered others and through the direction he offered others, uh, Anthony the Great is recognized as the father of organized monasticism and not just the ascetic life, but the father of monasticism. During one of St. Anthony's many discourses with the monks, a question is raised. Where does the soul go? What happens to the soul after death? Anthony internalized this and prayed so fervently to find an answer to this question that he was drawn during a dream to the window. He looked out the window and he saw the souls going by and this great monster taking some of the souls out of the air and dragging them down. Realizing at that very moment that what he experienced throughout his life, the reality of Satan, was true. And the reality that some souls pass by that snare of the devil and reach heaven. While Anthony was in the desert, there was very few times that he actually came out and lived in the world. Or he came out and visited the world. One instance was during the Arian controversy. The Arians were saying that Saint Anthony the Great was actually an Arian in thinking and that he was actually practicing and preaching the Arian theology. Arius was saying Christ was not God. He was a human being. He was born of a woman. He wasn't God. And that was just totally throwing Christianity as we know it out of whack. St. Anthony therefore decides to leave the wilderness, to go into the city of Alexandria, to inform the people, first of all, that he is not an Arian, and secondly, to reveal to the people the errors of the Arian belief. It had to be a, a, a wonderful sight for, for these townspeople to see St. Anthony come off the mountain because for about probably most of their lives, they've heard of this, this hermit that was up in the mountain. And I'm sure they were all curious why someone would stay up in the mountain. And then they have them come down and publicly condemn the Arians for what they were doing. It must have been fascinating just to talk to him. And I'm sure those people, their religious strength was built up 10 times just by talking to him. St. Athanasios tells us that in that time period, those few days that St. Anthony was in the city, more people were converted to Christianity than were in a whole year. St. Anthony leaves Alexandria and goes back to the mountain, into the wilderness, where he stays for about another 28 years. When Anthony was over 100 years old, he knew that God was calling him to enter his kingdom soon. So what he did was he distributed the few possessions he had between Athanasios and one of the other monks of the Egyptian desert. And he looked up to heaven and what he saw was as if there were friends cheering him on, telling him, yes, you've won the battle, you've won the race, come home. He smiled, he closed his eyes and he fell asleep in the Lord. I would say the same temptations that surrounded St. Anthony in the desert are many of the same temptations that we face today. The temptation of money, the temptation of sex, the temptation of greed, of wealth, of power. These are all temptations that we struggle with today. And we need to learn from his example by fleeing from the world, maybe not physically, but spiritually, fleeing from this world. We don't have to become monks and nuns in order to repent and in order to straighten out our lives. There are accounts, accounts of many, many married saints and even the acknowledgement among the monastic community that in some ways it's more difficult for us who stay, as we say, in the world to conduct that same battle. Anthony's example of life gives to us, as St. Athanasios taught, that ability to understand that we can transform our lives in this world to live for Christ, not being shackled by the cares of this life, but only freed by the bonds of love that is our Lord. For all the, the miracles, struggles, that St. Anthony did, encountered, experienced, the title he has received is God's Friend. That's what struck me most in reading the life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasius, that he's called God's friend. Because throughout his life, first and foremost, what was important for St. Anthony and what he taught the monastics, what he taught the lay people, the pilgrims that came out to him in the, in the wilderness, no matter where he was in the wilderness, the, the thing he would tell them time and time again was to love Christ and to love one another.
St. Anthony was a master of repentance. And that is the strongest image that I carry of St. Anthony. One of our professors used to tell us that on his deathbed, where he was nearly 100 years old, that from the years of repenting, that there were tracks in his face from the tears that it had eaten away at his cheeks. And he had some disciples who were around him as he was dying, and he was praying and praying that he could have more time to repent. His disciples were saying, but Father Anthony, you're a master of repentance. What are you talking about? And he told them, no, I've only begun. No.